So, you, you dropped a little bit of money on terrain and miniatures for your D&D game, did you? <laughs> yeah, right. Who are you kidding? That $100 turned into $500, which turned into $1,000, and now you are several thousand dollars deep in Dwarven Forge terrain and Reaper Bones minis. And that's okay, I'm right there with you. However, after investing that much into your tabletop RPG, the last thing you want to do is screw it all up. So today we'll be talking about 10 mistakes to avoid with terrain and miniatures and what you should do instead. Number one, waiting until the game starts to find the miniatures you need. Are you freaking kidding me? You have hundreds, if not thousands of miniatures kicking around, filling tackle boxes, tool chests, and bookshelves. And you want to wait until the middle of the game session when that dramatic battle is about to begin. To root around in your crap and find the perfect minis to use. Dear Mr. Dungeon Master Sir, or Mrs. Dungeon Master Ma'am, please do not do that to your wonderful, precious players, lest they mutiny and melt your minis on baking sheets in the oven. Instead, when you are preparing for the game session, pick out the minis you think you'll need based on the adventure that you think the players might do. And of course, no DM can choose perfectly because you don't actually know what's gonna happen in the game session. So always have a handful of generic minis on hand too to fill in when the unexpected happens. Number two, not preparing and setting up terrain in advance. I, I was once a player in a game where the dungeon master had tons of amazing terrain he likely spent thousands of dollars on. And guess what? When he actually wanted to use some terrain, he would go to the terrain shelves, look around, gather up what he needed, and then bring it to the table where he'd then assemble it for us. The process could take 10 or 15 minutes, during which time the players were just waiting, waiting, waiting to fight some bad guys. And by the time the terrain was set up, more than a bit of the excitement had passed. So don't be like that guy. Find and set up the terrain you'll need in advance. Either lay it out on the table, assembling pieces of the dungeon, or the entire dungeon, and then cover the different rooms up with cloth or cardboard squares so that your players can't see it until you're ready for them to. Imagine the drama of unveiling an amazing set piece of terrain for your eager players. Very cool. You can also assemble terrain on top of pieces of thin plywood, which you store off to the side on shelves, and then you bring it out to the table when you need it. This, of course, probably only really works for smaller set pieces. And the same applies to drawing the map on a grid if you don't use terrain and use a grid instead. Basically, as much as possible, draw the maps out in advance when you can. Then you cover the map up with pieces of paper until you're ready to unveil the areas to your players. By the way, I'll put a link down to some large one-inch grid paper that works really well for this. Number three. Neglecting narrative description. Just because you literally have a physical representation of the location, characters, and monsters, doesn't mean you should stop describing the scene and the creatures to your players. You still want to stoke your players' imaginations with eloquent narrative descriptions. Never skimp on that. The way I like to do this is by describing things as I draw them on the grid. You see a crevasse that stretches what must be hundreds of feet into the darkness below, and off to the side here are several large stalagmites that protrude from the cavern floor, much like the maw of a beast awaiting its prey. And I say that as I go and draw it, you know. Now, perhaps you bought a bunch of terrain and minis because you aren't good at delivering eloquent narrative descriptions to your players. Well, that's fair, but with Describe, you still can. Over at Describe.com, you can find thousands of scenes of beautiful box text that you can read or paraphrase. Terrifies? Paraphrase! It's a new type of French fry. We have invented a new type of French fry. I don't even know what that would be. Zach, that's your homework assignment. Go figure that out. Don't argue, just do it. That you can read or paraphrase to your players. Monsters, places, spells, magic items, dialogue, and more. Describe even has interactive maps with rooms and feature descriptions, tags that curate related scenes, and an easy to use search field where you can just type in what you're looking for and get instant results. So stop stumbling over your tongue and sign up for Describe at the link below, the perfect companion for your terrain and minis. There are hundreds of scenes available free of charge for you to try out. And if you decide to unlock more scenes with a paid subscription, be sure to use the discount code, the DM layer to save 10% on your first payment. Number four, having the monster mini on the map too soon. Here's what happens the moment you reveal a section of the map that has monsters in it. Your players practically ignore whatever else you have to say about the room as their minds fixate on the three bugbears standing there. Three bugbears? 
Holy crap, those goblins nearly killed us. What are we gonna do about these bugbears, guys? Instead, describe the room first, and then plop the three minis representing those bugbears on the map and describe the creatures to them. This ensures your players actually pay attention to the first part of your description. Or you can do the opposite. Have the monster minis on the map, but only describe the room at a very high level. Say the details for later after the combat or when it becomes apparent that the encounter will be resolved by social interaction. Number five, only playing with the correct miniatures. As someone who already has hundreds of miniatures, maybe even thousands, nah, nah, hundreds. Allow me to burst your bubble as gently as possible. You'll never have a miniature for every possible monster you'll use in your game. Sorry champ, believe me, I've tried, it's a losing battle. And you especially won't have them all painted. So don't fret too much about needing to have the perfect miniature for characters and monsters. Instead, get something as close as possible and call it a day. In fact, as long as it's the correct size on the grid, medium, large, huge, etc., it'll get the job done just fine. Remember, you're still using narrative description, so it's all good. By the way, if you're trying to grow your miniature collection, see my video on how to get inexpensive miniatures for D&D at the link below. Number six, only using painted miniatures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I'll believe that when I see it. Shoot. Many of us have enough unpainted minis kicking around from the past Reaper Bones Kickstarters to last us well into our golden years as far as mini painting projects go. There are some games where it's heavily frowned upon to use unpainted minis, such as Warhammer 400K, I believe. And I've heard that there are conventions and tournaments that forbid unpainted minis. However, D&D isn't like that. You, you wanna put a naked miniature on the board? Just go right on ahead. Most folks are just stoked to have miniatures, any miniatures, to play with, and I have never heard of anyone getting bent out of shape over unpainted minis in D&D. Oh, and real quick, if you're getting value out of this video and enjoy the sweet, soothing drone of my voice, give me a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let us all know how many pounds of terrain and minis you probably own. Yes, pounds, not quantities. We want you to weigh them. Number seven, not thinking through the game mechanics for terrain. How is visibility impacted by thick undergrowth? What is the DC for some to climb this rock or tree. Does that knee deep muck create difficult terrain? Whether you're deploying terrain or just drawing it on a grid, you should really have an idea of how it affects the game. Your players are going to be interacting with it after all. You should really know how it works. Now, depending on how good you are at improvising, you may or may not need to consider those things in advance of the game. However, you should certainly be using terrain's effects on game mechanics during the game, even if you're just making it all up on the fly. Number eight. Eight, going overboard. Okay, sure, your players are adventuring into a swamp, but does that mean you really need to create a mini swamp with actual murky water, floating twigs, and fog clinging just above the surface? Probably not. Though it sure would make a great Reddit post that gets lots of upvotes. If you're going for that sort of thing, I guess it's probably worth your time and effort, but. You can I can see the post now. I made this for my D&D players. Lots of upvotes, karma, right there, baby. Woo! You'll, all you need to do is spend three weekends to create your mini swamp. Not necessarily ragging on people who put that sort of effort and love into their game. But just be aware that it isn't 100% necessary. If you like doing it, and you love it, and it's, you get all stoked on it, and you have the time, and you wanna do that, rock and roll. Just be aware that that is not the standard that you must achieve. That is above and beyond something that some people love doing and is wonderful, but don't feel like you have to do that. Don't feel like if you don't do that, you suck, because it's not true. Anyway, sometimes less is more as long as you have boundaries, hazards, cover, and interactable objects. Well, that's probably good enough. Once you start adding too much, the map and terrain is going to start getting cluttered and perhaps confusing for the players. Furthermore, if much of the terrain you deploy has just the basics, then when you do deploy that amazing set piece for the final boss battle, it's going to be that much cooler by comparison. I'm definitely gonna get some negative comments about people who have created actual swamps with water, and they're gonna be like, Luke, you suck, what a jerk. Sorry. Number nine, overthinking it. Calm down. Your terrain doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to consider every little thing. If you missed the splotch of mud in the corner of the map for your murder investigation adventure, 
it'll be fine. Your description of the room will fill in whatever your terrain and map leave out. Remember, D&D is a game about imagination. You can use yours when you create the adventures, NPCs, puzzles, and traps. Trust that your players can use theirs when you deploy your train and draw your maps. Number 10, feeling like you must use terrain and minis. Please never forget that terrain and miniatures are 100% optional. There are thousands of groups that play using theater of the mind every day and they all have an amazing time. Well, maybe not all of them, but there are some of them that have an amazing time. So if you're still in high school, a broke college student, or you're a grown adult with $105,000 worth of student loans that you're still chipping away at, you don't need terrain and miniatures to run an amazing game for your players. Click on the screen now to binge another fine DM Layer video or to become a DM Layer patron and get an issue of Layer Magazine every month. And until next time, melt your Dungeon Master's minis in the oven.